Lord, you have our undivided attention because when we sing to you that from our first breath until our final breath, we find our life in you, that is no joke. That is no kidding. That is reality. So we thank you that from our birth till our li- through our life until our deaths, Uh, We are yours, and we live eternally in your presence. Thank you for that, in Christ's name. Amen. Well, good morning. Great to see each of you. Um, This is an interesting time of the year, isn't it? It's hard to believe we we get so excited about summer and everything that goes with it, and then we begin to realize around the end of July that it's starting to be the second half of summer. Uh, school starts in Pasadena in three weeks, in L.A. in two weeks. Teachers go back this Thursday in Arizona. And all of a sudden, you begin to realize, wow, what's happened to this summer? Uh, so, we, so we look back a little bit before we look forward a little bit. And this has been a fun couple of months, you know, even going back to May. A lot of you were here for our uh, 75th anniversary, May 5th, and we just reminisced about the wonderful history of this church, 75 years right here on Cordoba. It's thinking this week, though, that um, as long as 75 years is, uh, what if you went back 255 years? What was, what was here where we're sitting today 255 years ago? 1769, Uh, Some of you are familiar with this. Um, There was an expedition that was started in Mexico, and it was called the Portola Expedition, led by Gaspar de Portola. And uh, they came from Mexico up through this way and stopped at what is now San Gabriel Mission. And it's more, we can't prove it because no one was there with a camera, but it's more than likely because we know the route they took that it's pretty sure that Portola and his troop came right through where we are today, 255 years ago. And uh, they proceeded uh, west, and they came to um, what we now call the 134 freeway, and they had to dip down through the Arroyo Seco, and then they came into what is now uh, Eagle Rock, the community of Eagle Rock, and, and they saw for the first time that big stone eagle rock. And they knew from the Native Americans that there was a legend about, that's why they called it the eagle rock, and we won't get into that legend this morning. But because they spoke Spanish, they gave it a Spanish name. Do you know what the name of the eagle rock is in Spanish? El Gordo. What's El Gordo mean in Spanish? The fat one because the Eagle Rock is just a big mound, right? So if you go west on the 134, you'll see it. If you come east, you'll really see it. And uh, that's Eagle Rock. Um, Jump up a couple of hundred years. Uh, When I was 11 years old, my very first job, uh, 11 years old, you were old enough to be a paper boy in Eagle Rock. And in those days, Eagle Rock had a newspaper called the Eagle Rock Sentinel and it's not in existence anymore. But um, on the the masthead of the Eagle Rock Sentinel, it was an etching of the Eagle Rock, El Gordo, and then then the the, uh, motto of of the newspaper was underneath it. And the motto was, a community built upon a rock. A community built upon a rock. That was, the, that was for, I don't know, 100 years. That was the Eagle Rock Sentinel. Um, so we think about a community that comes together uh, geographically. And if you grew up in Eagle Rock, and even, you know, if went to Eagle, the alma mater of Eagle Rock High School, uh, I'm an, a proud alumni, far above the city's turmoil, arched by blue above. Eagle Rock, to thee we proudly take the name we love. <laughs> I could sing it for you, but uh, you know. Uh, but anyway, it goes on and on and on. So the whole community built upon a rock. Now you come here back to Trinity, 2024, uh, 
and whether you're at a different church uh, in your past or you're going to be a different church in your future, the fact is that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you too are part of a community built upon a rock, right? Biblically, uh, where do you see that? That's, that's a very biblical... Eagle Rock didn't just come up with that term, right? Um, if you turn in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 18, when Jesus and his 12 disciples go away for a little retreat, and he poses this question, who do people say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Christ, right? You're the Messiah. And then... Jesus turns to Peter and he says, you are, you were Simon, you were born with the name Simon, but your name is now Simon Peter, or your, your name is Peter, literally Petros in Greek. And then he makes a very subtle shift in his next comment. He, he, he says, and upon this rock I will build, Petros just means rock, and upon this but he doesn't say, upon this Petros, I'll build my church. He says, upon this Petra, I'll build my church. So that it's, it's kind of subtle, and you don't... So, so he's not saying that Peter specifically will be the, the, the foundation of the church, but it will be Peter's confession. The, the, the solidity and the rock that Peter verbalizes, that will be the foundation of the church. That'll be the rock that the community's built on. Um, now, as you move on through uh, into the Gospels, and now we're going to finish today. We've been in this series in the book of Acts, first three chapters. We're going to uh, look at chapter 3, verses 1 to 26. Um, you begin to, and we, we still don't see it. It'll be a little bit later in Acts, but we've been calling this series the most important community in history and uh, the community eventually uh, gets actually a new name it, it, it begins to be called the church and again that's just a greek word the ecclesia or in spanish is iglesia right actually spanish sounds more like uh, ecclesia than than church does um, but ecclesia is just two greek words ek means out of, and kalia means to call. And so the church, literally the church are, is a community of people that are called out from, out of the wider society. And the church is powered, as we saw a couple of weeks ago on the day of Pentecost, by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, is, as we say in English, is, is the paraclete. And that, again, that's just two words, para kaleo, to call, para just means alongside. And so the church is called out of the wider society, and it's powered by the Holy Spirit, which is called alongside those who are called out of. And so here we are, Trinity Baptist, trying to live that out after all these years not just 255, but 2,000 years. So we're going to look this morning, and, and by the way, I, I saw this this week, and I, I really don't even know uh, who said this, but I thought it was, um, I just read it briefly, and, and I have no idea who the author was. I'd love to give him credit, but um, it was just a very simple definition of, of, of a church. Of a church. It could be Trinity Baptist, could be another church that you've been part of. Uh, and this person's definition was simply this. It, a church is made up of people from diverse backgrounds unified by a common faith. A church is people from diverse backgrounds unified by a common faith. I thought, wow, that's, of all the definitions I've heard of a church, that may be the best. Simple, easy to remember. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at uh, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 to 2. Uh, I'll just start with the first 10 verses. And what we see in, in chapter 3 is, and we said this last week, it's really just an illustration of what we actually looked at last week. If you look at chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, 
that's a description of this important community that they devoted them, they were all together, devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, to prayers, and they were all together sharing their resources with each other, praising God, having favor with all the people. So that's kind of a, um, those five verses are a description of what the community looked like. Now, <clears throat> in chapter three, you're gonna see that illustrated. How does that life get lived out? And as we said last week, and we've, we've said this many, many times, um, life uh, in the community of, of Jesus, it's always, um, as our, our, our good friend, Pastor Evie Hill used to say, it's, it's this uh, challenge to move from your IQ to your I do, to put your IQ and your I do together. And sometimes your IQ comes first, and then it's illustrated by your I do. Sometimes your I do comes first, and then it's illustrated by your IQ. Now, I don't want to get too silly with that, but that's, that's a simple way of seeing what goes on in chapter 3. Because the first thing that happens in, in, in the first 10 verses, what you see happen is an illustration of I do, or we do. This, this is the church acting. And then in 11 to 26, you might call it the IQ. This is how the actions are explained. Uh, this is Peter's second sermon. It's an appeal to the mind. It's an explanation. He's giving a reason for the actions that take place in the first 10 verses. So let me just read a couple of these verses, make a few comments. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple. They're still in Jerusalem at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. That's three o'clock in the afternoon. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, raised him up. Immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazing amazement at what had happened to him. So first of all, it's a community that acts with power and compassion. That defines this important community. Um, it's the hour of, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, as we said last week, the, the first Christians were also Jewish in the first uh, 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 activity. They were still involved in temple worship, right? And as you well know, the temple had morning prayer and sacrifice and then afternoon prayer and sacrifice that led into the evening. Three o'clock was designated as the hour of prayer. It's interesting to think about this because three o'clock in the afternoon was also uh, the very moment where on the cross, when Jesus hung on the cross, he cried out, it is finished. It is finished. But as we've said many, many times here, he said, it is finished. What he didn't say was, I am finished. And the proof of that is what takes place here in this healing of this man crippled from birth because Jesus isn't finished, and it's, it, it's, the it's not Peter and John's power. It's, it's the power of God through Christ, through the presence of the Holy Spirit that, that takes place here. Um, and also notice that this man who, he's lame from birth, now he was being carried. What's that remind you of? Luke chapter 5, remember when the, uh, Jesus was in the synagogue and, and this this man crippled from birth as well. Uh, his friends brought him. There was no way to get inside, so they 
busted a hole in the ceiling and lowered him down, and then Jesus heals him. So the exact same things happened here. Jesus healed someone crippled from birth. He was carried to the synagogue. This man is now carried to the temple, also crippled from birth. And he's waiting at the gate asking for alms. Now, why is that significant? In Jewish religion at this point, alm, we don't use, that's kind of an old-fashioned word, but um, to give alms, in other words, um, uh, that would be similar in our generation if if, um, you, you just give to a charity or your, you know, uh, whatever. But almsgiving in, in first century Judaism, that was actually considered meritorious. You would gain merit with God if you gave to the poor, to the lame, to the sick, uh, to the, the crippled. Uh, and so it was a way to gain favor with God. Jesus actually talks about that in Matthew t- chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount, doesn't he? He says, when you give alms, he expects you to give alms. But Jesus says, when you give alms, don't be like the hypocrites that stand on a street corner and blow a trumpet so everybody will see them. But he says what? When you give alms, don't let your left hand know what the right hand's doing. Do it in private. Do it in secret. And then you win favor with God. So it's not that we don't give. We don't give alms, uh, whatever we call it in our generation, but Jesus' whole point was, I expect you to do that for people in need. Just don't blow your own trumpet. Don't call attention to yourself. It's to be done quietly and in private. And so this man was used to this. He, and we find later in chapter 4, verse 22, he was over 40 years old. So apparently from birth, he, he'd been lame. He hadn't been able to walk for 40 years. And every day, he's at the gate. Now, what happens, and and you've seen this around town. I mean, all of us have been uh, walking down the sidewalk, and you see someone that maybe is there almost every day, begging, asking for money. Um, uh, After a while, most people that do that get used to being ignored. Uh, They get used to kind of a casual, maybe a glance or a look, but this man, after 40 years of begging, uh, was, was, was kind of used to casual disregard. And that's why Peter says, when, when he, he asked him he, you know, for alms, Peter, verse 4, directed his gaze at him. And then this is a very strong word. He, he's almost, he, he probably raising his voice, said, look at us. Why would he say that? Probably because after 40 years, this guy was used to just not looking at people because people didn't look at him. And uh, so it's very firm. He fixed his attention on them. So this is a very intense moment. And what was his expectation? That he would receive something. So he expected, but Peter responds, I don't have silver, I don't have gold but this is what I do have. In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, not in the name of Peter, not in the name of John, but in the name of Jesus. The power is not in Peter. The power is not in John. They are just the the conduit, the the instrument by the power of God. Rise up and walk. And he not only rose up and walked, but, you know, look look at, he walked, he leaped, he praised God, and then he entered the temple with them. Now, here's something that we don't know, but it makes you wonder. He'd been sitting at the gate of the temple for 40 years asking for help. And then it says that he went with Peter and John inside the temple. Was that the first time he'd ever been inside? Likely. Um, and this is a Jewish man and a Jewish community that said that the temple was the center of our life and God was the one that we focused all of our attention on. But had he spent 40 years being an outsider looking in? Maybe. 
maybe, we don't know for sure, but it makes you wonder. And now he's not only leaping, and it's an instantaneous healing, and now he's in sight. Now he's in sight. And the crowd run, rushes. They've, they've seen this guy for 40 years. And, and what's their response? Wonder. They're amazed at what happened. Um, now he's part of the community. He's in sight. He's part of the community in a way he's never been before. So it's a community that acts with power, but the power is from God. It's not in Peter, it's not in John. Um, but it's compassion. It's, it's seeing people um, with legitimate need that have been excluded from community. And that's just so basic, so basic to the Christian faith. The second part of this, though, it's also a community that speaks with clarity and conviction because it's one thing to act. Um, that's kind of the I do part of this. Now you move into the IQ part of it. In other words, now Peter is actually living out what he will later say in his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where he writes this, in, in my observation, the best explanation that's ever been written for evangelism, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that's within you, and yet do it with gentleness and respect. And Peter lives this out here. Um, his sermon, we're not gonna read all of the, down to verse 26. It's very, it has, it's very similar to a sermon on Pentecost because it, it, it really has two parts. Uh, verses 12 to 16 are really a proclamation and an explanation. Uh, he's trying to explain. He says, men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or our own piety we have made him walk? So Peter himself is trying to, trying to deflect attention off of himself. Yes, this happened, but it's not my power. It's not my piety. Um, later in the book of Acts, you'll see a very similar thing happen with the Apostle Paul. Chapter 14 of Acts, he and Barnabas were, were uh, in modern-day Turkey, and, and they also had a, a, a crippled man from birth who they also healed. And what was the response of the crowd? They said, you're God's. They said, uh, Barnabas, you're Zeus. Zeus was the, 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 the highest god in Greek mythology. And they said, Paul, you're Hermes. Hermes in Greek mythology was the son of Zeus. He was the messenger, the, the spokesperson for God. And so they, Paul had the same problem. Paul and Barnabas had to do the same thing Peter did here. They said, no, 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 no. Don't worship us. Don't worship us. We're not God. We're doing this through the power of God, through Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So he's trying to deflect attention off of himself. Um, it's in the name of God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he's building a bridge. He's saying, look, we're Jews, you're Jews. We believe that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob are part of our history. And so we appeal to them, but they pointed to the Messiah. Um, they predicted this would happen. And then verse 15, he, he doesn't let them off the hook. This sounds a little bit more like Pentecost. You killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So he's saying, listen, don't worship us. And Peter, of all people, had failed miserably. He denied Christ three times, right? Right? But he's, but, he, but he's saying to them, listen, you need to face the truth about yourself. As we saw a couple of weeks ago, you, along with the Romans, killed Christ. But as I said a couple of weeks ago uh, as well, and I'll just repeat it again today, so who's responsible for the death of Jesus? Jewish people, Romans, and me. I killed Christ. It's my sin. You did. We're all responsible. Christ died for the sins of all of us. So we all participate uh, in this. 
It's interesting that at this time in history, uh, most of you, uh, if you've been in the medical field, and every doctor I know still takes the, you heard of the Hippocratic Oath? Hippocratic Oath was um, uh, basically written even before Christ. In Greece, there was this man, Hippocrates. Hippocrates wrote kind of the first medical uh, book. And uh, one of the things Hippocrates wrote, that he had a whole section on diseases. And, and Hippocrates uh, had a whole section in his medical textbook on lame people that were born crippled or lame. And, he, he, and this was, people uh, believed this at the time of Jesus because Hippocrates said it, and he was the medical authority in, in the first generation Mediterranean world. And he, Hippocrates wrote in that first medical book, he said, lameness is a permanent disability. There's no treatment for it. That was the culture that, that Jesus came into, that Peter came into, that Paul came into. And all of a sudden, they see all this man. Uh, that, I wonder what Hippocrates would have said if he was there. Wow, I guess I need to rewrite my textbook, right? Um, this has never happened. The, the, the medical authority said it couldn't happen. Um, now, the last thing that I think is important here, if you look at verses 17 to 26, then he begins to move from the proclamation to a call for repentance. But look how he starts out. Verse 17, and now brothers. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm proclaiming how this happened. I'm also willing to say that you and I and all of us are responsible for killing the author of life. But you're my brother. You're brothers. You're my sisters. And, and, and then he really softens it. He says, you acted in ignorance, and so did your rulers, verse 17. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that as Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, in other words, turn, repent, turn away. You're going the wrong direction. Turn again that your sins may be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send the Christ appointed for you. Um, and so what he's trying to, trying to say here is that the, the Jewish people had a great privilege God chose them. He sent the Messiah to them. They heard the good news first, but they had turned in the wrong direction. They need to come back. Um, and all the prophets pointed to this. He closes up this section. Uh, 25, you are the sons of the prophets of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So there's a proclamation, but there's also a call for repentance. And yet there's this great blessing. If they do this, this is what happens. There's a couple of things maybe just to close with. Um, this, uh, it, not only as we close out this six-week um, series we've been in on community but just in this section here uh, really these first three chapters of Acts really um, they, they emphasize the priorities it, it's one thing to be part of a community of, of, of Jesus to be in the church to be a part of the followers of Christ geographically, historically wherever you find yourself um, but there are priorities that go with it and uh, the, the number one priority is that you celebrate Christ. You don't celebrate celebrities. Big difference. And a lot of, you know, we live in Southern California. We're 10, mi we're 10 miles away from the entertainment capital of the world, Hollywood, right? So you, if you've grown up in Southern California, you're, you're used to celebrities, uh, it's, 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 it, it's at warp speed. Uh, but friends, you can enjoy a good movie or a good TV program. You can honor those that 
um, make us laugh and entertain us. There's an appropriate place for entertainment in life. But never, never, never bring that in to the community of Christ. And unfortunately, uh, we've, you know, the Christian community uh, has not always shied away from that. Uh, we make celebrities out of preachers, out of missionaries, out of worship leaders, out of musicians, and it's not to be. Um, Christ is our center. He is the power. We act in compassion. Uh, we point people as Paul and Barnabas uh, did. You know, I, Paul says, I'm not Hermes. Barnabas is not Zeus. Uh, don't bow down to us. We are not gods. Uh, and it's compassion with power it's conviction with clear. We've got to be clear about this. It's, it's, we exercise the power of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit compassionately, uh, but we speak with conviction, but it has to be clear. You have to help people. That's, that's what Peter said. Give a reason for the hope that's within you. It's rational. It's reasonable. Um, let me just uh, finish with this. Uh, last night, I had, a, I had a wonderful time last night. I, uh, I, have a, I have 14 nieces and nephews, and I don't always, they're scattered all over the country. A bunch of them got, to, we had a little family reunion last night uh, at this restaurant in San Pedro. And uh, my nieces and nephews, a lot of them I hadn't seen for a long time. And uh, uh, they're just fun watching them grow up, and I've always been involved in their life uh, since they were babies. And, but it's interesting now, they're starting to get to the age where they're starting to, um, th uh, they've been acquiring life experience and life uh, possessions for several years. Some of them, the older ones now, are starting, you can see it, they're starting to think about, hmm, what are my values? Have I acquired too much or too little? You know, what's... Uh, so as the older member of the family now, it's very interesting because now they're starting to ask questions. And uh, last night, um, uh, one of my nephews uh, there, his mother was um, my oldest sister, Nancy, and I think I've told you this before. Uh, three years ago, my, my sister Nancy got a very rare form of cancer and uh, uh, only 400 cases in many medical history. She happened to be one of them. She had a... a just one of the most painful deaths. I've, I was with her the, the moment she died, and it was just, it was excruciating watching her die. And uh, her son was with me at her deathbed, and took him, it's taken him about three years to kind of get over that. Uh, but he, la he asked me last night, he said, uh, you know, do you, do you have any memory? He says, I've been thinking about my mother a lot. He says, um, any, anything stand out from my mom that you, can pass on to me and my cousins, and all the, so the whole table started listening. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something. Um, a couple of days before your mother died, she was kind of lucid. I was, I was spending the afternoon with her. We were kind of reminiscing about our childhood. And uh, I told her, I said, you know, Nancy, I said, you and I both know that your time on earth is coming to an end. And uh, I just wondered, do you have any advice for your little brother? before you go and she had come back to she had a she had a crazy life but she came back to Christian faith thankfully later in life so I know she's in heaven but uh, she looked at me and she goes yeah I, I got a piece of advice for you I go what is it she goes live simple and travel light I go wow you want to unpack that for me and here's what she said and I told her all my nieces I mean you the whole table is list at this point. So it was an opportunity for the, the next generation to hear this. And um, I said, here's, what, here's how she explained that comment. She said, look, everything you own in life is a potential distraction from what's really important. And it's not that you can't own things and it and it's not that you shouldn't own, you need some things, you need to own some things just to have a normal, pleasant life. But you need to regularly take an inventory. You need to look at everything that you own and ask yourself, do I really need this? 
And the second part of that question is, does someone else need this more than I do? And if they do, give it away. Because everything you own takes time and energy. It may be subconscious. You may not be conscious that you're thinking about it, but you're spending time. And a lot of stuff you own needs maintenance. So a lot of the energy that you're spending is on just maintaining uh, things that you own. Uh, and I said, wow, that's, I think now I understand live simple travel light. She goes, well, I hope so. And uh, so I told all the nieces and nephews that last, I mean, all around the table, all of them just went. I go, good, good. That's good, that's good for you. You need to think about that. So here's what I'm going to ask you to think about. It's July 28th. Uh, I don't know why, and may, maybe you all have your own rhythm, but I've always found the month of August, partly because it's the end of summer, it's the last rays of summer. I always get very reflective in the month of August because I realize, wow, the fun times are <laughs> coming to an end. School's going to start. Now we're not in school. Most of us aren't in school anymore. But there, there's something about August that just makes you, ooh, I need to just think of, you know, the endless summer is, is no longer inlet. It's coming to an end. Labor Day is September 2nd this year. So you have, and I have, uh, 28, so we got 4, 35, we got 37 days to Labor Day. So here's your homework. Whether you're in your school or not, I'm going to give you some homework. It's, you got 37 days of homework. Here's your homework. Over the next month, I really, really pray. Uh, I'm asking you, to, I can't make you do this. I'm just going to ask you to do it. But I pray that you do because I just find what my sister said and what my nieces and nephews, uh, how they responded last night, how crucial this is, friends. You need to take an inventory of everything you own in the next 30 days. And you need to ask yourself, do you really need this? Is there someone that needs it more than I do? Because, friends, if you're not careful, uh, you're already distracted by what you own. You probably don't realize how much time and energy you're giving to uh, maybe start with your closet. What's in your closet? If you haven't worn it in a year, you're not going to wear it. Give it away. Um, the last thing I would just say to maybe support that is I talk to people every week more than any other time in my lifetime I have more people now on a weekly basis telling me that they're under stress they're stressed out and they ask me what's the answer how do you get rid of stress and I've just come to the conclusion there's a lot of ways to get rid of stress one of the ways to get rid of stress is not to own so much because part of stress is you're just consciously and subconsciously spending a whole lot of time thinking about stuff that you own and it's stressing you out live simple travel light let's sing and then we will be done for this morning Please let us stand together for our last hymn we'll be singing turn your eyes upon Jesus it's a chorus it will be on the screen
Lord Jesus, you have turned your eyes upon us and you have seen the beauty that you have created in us, but you've also seen all of the clutter and all of the disorganization and all of the Trump, Trump Fied values that we just uh, can't seem to get rid of. Uh, Lord, we, we, we struggle. We, um, we just clutter up our lives with things that aren't important. And so we just ask you, oh God, and we, we, we pray that not only for ourselves, but we pray it for our community. We pray for those in our leadership. We pray for all of those that are um, uh, involved in leadership and uh, striving for leadership. We just pray, oh God, that you would bless us and keep us, make your face to shine down upon us and grant us your peace now and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.